All right. Um, well, while the last few people filter in, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is Josh Morrison. I'm the president of One Day Sooner, and I'm also on the board of directors for the Rikers Debate Project. And I'm just really thrilled uh, about this event, about the really great turnout, uh, about the amazing judges, and what I think is going to be a really great debate today. Um, and so basically what I'm going to do right now is just tell you a little bit about One Day Sooner and Rikers Debate, um, two organizations um, that I'm involved with that I, that I really care about and um, I'm really excited to, about. And um, then I'll turn it over to Gabrielle, um, who'll give you a bit of background about um, the topic today um, to sort of orient you because it's a bit unusual for, for Rikers debate. It's not a criminal justice topic and it's a little bit uh, complicated. And then uh, I'll tell you a bit about the debate format. We'll have our debate. The judges will go off and confer um, for about 15, 20 minutes while we have a panel of people who've been in a challenge study for COVID-19. Uh, and then we'll hear the judges reasoning and um, then uh, we'll kind of have a, um, some discussion in breakout rooms. Uh, so first, just to, to give a bit of background, um, the, the one thing I want to do is um, also just want to thank uh, Peter Jaworski and the Georgetown Institute for the Study of Market and Ethics. Uh, this is the second debate we've done together. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did a debate like this about kidney donation. Um, that was also really great. That had the advantage of being in person, uh, which we'd all love, love to be doing, but you know, Omicron had other plans. Um, but it's been great to work with Peter on different issues around kidney donation and bone marrow donation. And we really appreciate um, him and, and the Institute for hosting uh, this debate tonight. And um, so first I just wanna tell you a bit about uh, One Day Sooner. So One Day Sooner is a group, uh, we started a couple of years ago, and we represent people who want to improve scientific research and save lives by participating in challenge studies. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about challenge studies today, but it's a sort of high risk, high reward study. We we're actually deliberately exposing people to infection to, to learn about a disease. And, you know, we started with COVID. Um, like I said, you're going to meet people um, uh, who've been in COVID challenge studies. So I won't talk too much about COVID today, uh, except to say we think that there's a, you know, still a really great need um, and use for challenge studies to develop things like a universal coronavirus vaccine, um, which we think is, is really important. And even some of our judges are actually, uh, are actually experts on and working on that right now. Um, but also, you know, today's debate is really about um, kind of what we see as a large part about the future of One Day Sooner, which is diseases beyond COVID-19, um, and particularly neglected diseases that uh, affect a lot of people around the world, and you'll hear more about tuberculosis. And uh, we, um, I'm really excited to announce one thing I'll do is come out some good news, which is we're really thrilled um, to have a $2 million grant from uh, the Open Philanthropy project, which is really exciting. It's the biggest grant we've gotten to date. And it's largely to pursue um, some of this work around uh, these neglected diseases, TB being one, um, strep uh, is another one. But, um, you know, there's really the same reasons that challenge days can be helpful for COVID um, of, you know, being faster, being cheaper, being able to, to study a disease, you know, experimentally um, and learn a lot. You know, those are also even more valuable in a lot of ways for, for these other diseases. So um, the other thing that, that, you know, One Day Sooner is unique about, not just in the fact that we uh, focus on challenge studies, but also that we focus on representing the people who are in those studies, representing research participants. Because we think research policy can be improved by giving more of a voice and more of a say to the people who are actually in those studies. And that's where kind of the mission of Rikers Debate and the mission of One Day Sooner are really aligned philosophically where Riker's debate is really about giving a say to currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated uh, people. And, um, and so it's a similar idea of trying to improve our policy making and our political decision making by giving more of a voice to people that don't have enough of a voice uh, already in, in those processes. And Riker's debate was founded uh, a bit about five years ago now a bit, bit more, about five and a half years ago. And uh, we're an all volunteer organization um, with the exception of paying people who are formerly incarcerated, um, like two of our debaters, Charles and Familia today are our Rikers Debate Fellows. And um, as an organization, you know, we uh, have had a, a lot of success with, you know, raising some of these issues, raising the voices of people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. And we've taught before COVID, 
uh, in six different states, uh, more than a dozen facilities. Um, but COVID's really, really made that difficult. And it's really been a, um, you know, obviously it's been an awful situation for, for everyone around the world, but I think it's had a really major impact on people um, who are incarcerated. And so I wanted to kind of take this, this last moment just to mention, you know, what, what most people uh, don't know, and I didn't know until someone else mentioned it to me today, is there's actually a hunger strike going on at Rikers right now because of the conditions there. And um, there's a lot of ways, you know, the conditions of Rikers have been bad for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of problems with that. I think there was a great New York Times piece recently that talked about, you know, the fact that the, the problem right now is basically not enough people, not enough um, correction officers are showing up to work in order to um, have a safe facility. And there's the, the um, more people are dying at Rikers as a result. There's, I think, the highest uh, death rate at Rikers um, in maybe ever, or certainly the last uh, 10 or 20 years. Um, last year, uh, you know, some of that's COVID, but a lot of that are deaths like suicides or things that, that aren't COVID. And, you know, Rikers, um, the New York City Department of Correction spends uh, about five times what the average city spends for their um, correction uh, per, per detainee. Um, and there are more than one correction officer per detainee. And I think that's something, you know, we, we hope that um, having, highlighting the voices of people who are incarcerated and for people from Rikers uh, is going to be hopefully something that can help uh, raise these issues and hopefully ultimately um, address them. Uh, so with that, I will turn things over to Gabrielle, who, tell, who will tell you more about um, tuberculosis and tuberculosis challenge studies before I um, tell you about the debate format and get us started with our round. Uh, welcome, everybody. I will be just going over the background of um, the debate so that everybody has context for the topic. And just a quick note, um, in order to sort of speak as clearly as I can, I'll be using tuberculosis or TB to refer to both the bacteria and the disease that the bacteria causes, whereas uh, scientifically it would be the infectious agent would be Mycobacterium tuberculosis. But to keep things clear, I will just say tuberculosis the whole time. So the question we're asking is, we're addressing in this debate is, if wild type tuberculosis challenge studies would be useful, would they be ethical to conduct? And um, to make sure that we you know, have the definitions of these clear, when we refer to wild type TB, it means the strain of the tuberculosis pathogen that exists in nature, infecting people worldwide. And by challenge trial, we're referring to volunteers who are volunteers being exposed to an infection intentionally in order to study a vaccine or treatment, whereas in standard clinical trials, participants are given either a vaccine or a placebo, and then they're just observed to see if they become infected over the course of their day-to-day -day lives. So challenge trials, um, there we go. <laughs> so challenge trials provide imperfect models of the disease as it exists in nature. Given that participants are restricted to young, healthy people and exposed to a single strain of the disease in a highly controlled setting. So those considerations make it unclear how generalizable a challenge study is. In addition, participants uh, need to be treated, especially for tuberculosis, before they develop the disease. So researchers would only be able to study infection rather than the disease and would likely be unable to get the full spectrum of infection data. TB is an airborne disease that attacks the lungs. It is incredibly deadly. About a quarter of the world's population is infected with TB, and 15 million people have died of TB in the last decade, according to the WHO, the World Health Organization. Each person infected with TB has a 5 to 10% lifetime risk of developing the disease, which can remain latent for years. During latency, an infected person is not contagious, but once the disease becomes active, it is incredibly dangerous. Even with treatment, active TB has a 3% death rate. Without treatment, it has a 45% death rate. If somebody infected with TB is also infected with HIV, the combination has a near 100% death rate. And this is uh, especially important because a lot of the countries where TB is endemic, HIV is also very common and medical treatment may be more difficult to access. So there is an existing vaccine. The BCG vaccine was developed to protect against TB using um, a, a relative of the tuberculosis 
bacteria, which is a form of cow tuberculosis. Um, but it is relatively ineffective. It is given to infants and efficacy wanes away almost entirely by adulthood. That vaccine was developed 100 years ago and in that time, no new vaccines have been developed. So among other difficulties, TB has a relatively slow progression, meaning vaccine trials must be long running and involve thousands of people. This also makes them incredibly expensive. Um, another issue is that we don't know the correlates of protection for TB, which are the biological markers that researchers can look for that indicate immunity. So basically there isn't a clear immune response that researchers can target when they're developing a TB vaccine. A TB challenge trial could help, oh, sorry, TB challenge trial could help select from among promising vaccine candidates. So what we're looking at is the potential for a challenge trial to happen before phase three studies. Phase three study would measure efficacy, but as mentioned before, these are very expensive. So challenge trial could down select, making the process of sending a vaccine candidate to a phase three trial much less risky. It could also help clarify correlates of protection. And if challenge trials are run, you have to decide between using a wild type tuberculosis strain or a weakened strain or attenuated strain. Given that wild type tuberculosis is the natural form of the pathogen, challenge trial results could be assumed to be applicable to natural infection, but the dangers of natural infection would also apply. Tuberculosis is dangerous for both the participant and their community. Since treatment is not 100% effective, the risk of a challenge participant developing active disease is roughly one in 150. And because it's impossible to prove someone is not infected with TB, someone in the study could leave the study healthy and end up developing active tuberculosis years down the line and uh, give it to somebody who didn't consent to the challenge study. Although the majority of those infections would be latent, that is still a serious problem um, looking at both consent and the danger to the community. So what about attenuated strains? Um, so challenge studies with weakened strains of TB already exist. Helen McShane of Oxford is using the BCG vaccine as a challenge agent, and Sarah Fortune of Harvard is genetically engineering a TB bacterium with a kill switch, which uh, is a bacteria that will die when certain chemicals are withdrawn. However, any change to the pathogen that makes challenge trial safer might also make the results of the challenge trial less applicable to natural infection, but it's not clear how much less applicable. It could be fine. <laughs> Attenuated strains could be sufficiently similar to wild type TB that there really isn't an issue. Even if there is a difference, a model using an attenuated strain could still potentially clarify the relationship between human and animal vaccine trials. So, Despite these drawbacks, challenge trials for TB are still a very promising way to speed up the development of an urgently needed TB vaccine. This debate will go over the arguments for and against wild type TB challenge trials, which does not rule out um, weakened, attenuated TB challenge trials. Some of the key issues in this debate that will be addressed are the importance of developing a TB vaccine, the question of whether we need to use wild type TB, the danger of wild type TB, the relevance of weakened TB strains and the role of challenge trials. So I hope that uh, provided some background and um, you know, it should be a really, really interesting debate. And with that, I will turn it back over to Josh. All right, thanks Gabrielle. And um, so right now, just to quickly tell you all about the um, debate format. And um, if we haven't, uh, Danny, could you share that brochure? We have some people who can kind of look at it um, on their own. Um, so basically, it's uh, the style we do is parliamentary. It's a two by two, two on two uh, debate, and um, there are three speeches on each side. Um, in between each team's first two speeches and their kind of closing statements or their final speeches, uh, the audience gets to uh, some of the audience get to speak and give uh, floor speeches. There's three floor speeches. One is on what's called the government in favor of the resolution, in favor of wild type um, challenge tuberculosis challenge studies. One will be on opposition and one will be a, a crossbench that, that kind of makes points on, on both sides. And those will be two minutes. I'll also mention um, both to 
four speakers and, and debaters that uh, we're going to keep really strictly to time, um, by which I mean, uh, you know, after 30 seconds grace, after the um, your time is up, uh, you'll be muted. I'll be trying to give you time signals on the, the chat, and we'll definitely give you a signal before I mute you. Um, but wrap it up um, right on time. Um, and then the other thing, yeah, so if you want to give a floor speech, definitely message me um, that you're, you're interested in, uh, in it, and I'll call on people um, in between the fourth and fifth speech. Um, the other thing is that everyone in the audience gets to be a judge. Um, so everyone in the audience will vote. We'll share a, a link to a Google form. And um, the judges' votes will each count for one. So there'll be 12 judges' votes in total. And the audience vote will count um, for a total of five. Uh, so the um, so everyone gets to, to participate in that way. Uh, make sure to stick around after the judges confer or after the judges give their reason for decision, um, because we're going to break off into um, kind of small Zoom discussion sections of about eight to ten people each. Um, and with that, um, before we flip for sides to decide which team is going to actually argue which position, uh, I want to have the judges each introduce themselves. Uh, and so I'll call on them alphabetically and just make sure you can unmute yourself um, and uh, tell us all uh, a bit about who you are. Um, so first I'll call on uh, uh, Gabe. Hey, uh, everyone. Thanks so much for putting this on, Josh. Uh, this is an everyone at One Day Sooner in Rikers. This is great. Uh, I, my name is Gabe bankman fried I run Guardian Against Pandemics. Um, which is a nonprofit advocacy group that pushes for public investments at the local, state, and federal level to prevent the next pandemic. Um, that's, that's me. Great. Uh, Camilla? Hi. Um, I was a Rikers Debate Fellow. I'm now on the Board of Directors, and I am a community navigator. It's sort of like a homeless outreach worker for the Midtown Community Court. And... Um, yeah. Ashley? Hi, my name is Ashley Carrington Donaghy. I am a member of the Rikers Debate Project Board of Directors. I am also the chair of the New Jersey chapter. And for my career, I work as a data orchestration lead at Millennium Management. Uh, Anne? Hi, I'm Ann Ginsberg. I'm currently Deputy Director for TB Vaccines at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I spent most of my career trying to develop TB vaccines and drugs in the not-for-profit sector. Phil? Uh, hi, I'm Phil Krauss. I'm formerly a Deputy Director of the FDA's Office of Vaccine Research and Review. And there I was engaged in many discussions on the topic of human challenge trials uh, most recently, I was part of the WHO evaluation of human challenge trials for COVID, and I've also published uh, at least a little bit on this topic. Uh, Jake? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jake Lian, uh, the chief of the liver disease branch in the intramural program of the National Institute of Health. Now, I, I work on um, viral hepatitis, in particular hepatitis C. As many of you know that hepatitis C doesn't have a vaccine at this point. That's where, where the challenge study may come in. And uh, so it's really a great pleasure to, to be involved in this. And this is my first engagement with this program. I'm certainly uh, very interested in learning about what you all think about the challenge study, although in a different disease, but. <laughs> Hello, Larissa. Uh, hi, I'm Larissa McFarker. I'm a, a writer at the New Yorker magazine, and I wrote a book, Strangers Drowning, about people with an exceptionally strong sense of ethical duty, like the people at One Day Sooner. Uh, Matt? Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me. I am uh, Matt Memley. I'm the director of the Laboratory of Infectious Diseases Clinical Studies Unit at NIH. I'm an infectious disease physician, and I run a research group whose uh, primary work for the last decade has been influenza challenge studies. And I've personally challenged 500 people with influenza. Uh, Jerry? I'm Jerry Sadoff. I'm the senior advisor for vaccine development at Janssen and currently the clinical lead on the COVID-19 program that for vaccines in terms of phase one, phase two, and phase three studies. Um, I previously was the head of ARIS, which was the... Uh, Global TB Vaccine Foundation, 
And I've conducted myself uh, and designed uh, challenge studies against five different pathogens for humans. Uh, Alex? Hi, I'm Alex Sabrock. I'm a professor of economics at George Mason University. Uh, Nikki? I'm Nikki Tran. I'm the senior biosecurity fellow at the Institute for Progress. And I'm interested in developing and advocating for policies to improve people's well being, like this one might, and safeguard people from biological hazards, whether they're natural, accidental, or deliberate. Uh, and Matt? Are you still in Matt Iglesias and are you unmuted? All right, we'll get we'll wipe it to the end of the alphabet. Um, all right, hopefully Matt can rejoin us. Um, so now what I'm gonna do, uh, unless the debaters have any questions, I'm gonna flip a coin, um, maybe Jerusalem, uh, I'll make you uh, call it. And um, then you can pick, then uh, the winner will pick sides and we can get the round started. Great. All right. Okay. Heads. Let's see if I can actually. Throw it. Um, it is, I don't know if you can see, it is tails. Um, so, AB and Camellia, which side do you want? Camellia, do you want, want to... Opposition. Let's do it. All right. Um, so, with that, um, I call this house to order. And uh, I call on um, our Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Charles, to deliver the first constructive speech of the round, um, not to exceed, uh, was it three, uh, I think three minutes. Um, here, here. I do want to continue this uh, monumental event. <laughs> if I call, Today, on the bus, or anywhere, everybody looks. But I call in China, Russia, or Brazil, or South Africa, where tuberculosis is the number one killing disease, everyone will be alarmed. Today, we government says that wild type uh, trials are better, and therefore, we would like to say for, and support this position that one, wild type trials are better than attenuated trials. Two, consent and risks are legitimate. And three, advancing the wild type trials with advanced science. We know, we recognize that uh, tuberculosis is the number one killing disease worldwide. As we noted early, 15 million people has died from tuberculosis in the past decade. The, the death toll for tuberculosis, when you couple it with its ability to adapt to uh, the various other diseases that where your immune system is deficient, then it becomes monumental. Therefore, we believe that it's imperative that we come up with another form of testing or another form of eradicating this. The World Health Organization has took on the challenge of coming up with a study that says that by 2035, they want to eradicate tuberculosis worldwide. And in and, and doing this, they recognize that a new form of treatment or vaccine should be done. We recognize that wild type will produce this. And what, what wild type will produce, it will produce a vaccine that, one, it will be ethical because it's the right thing to do. Millions of people are dying because of the lack of support or the lack of interest in eradicating this disease worldwide. So we believe that if given the opportunity, wild type will produce the information that will give us the information that will allow us to go to a, a phase three where we will be able to have a vaccine that could actually eradicate the uh, pathogen. Second, or uh, thirdly, we, 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 present, we believe that in doing this, we'll be advancing uh, science in general, that the uh, study and the information that will come out of this will allow us to advance science in general more information that will come out of this particular study, wild type, will allow us to be able to look at this method that we're using as we did with COVID. We've seen uh, phase one, we've seen phase two, and now more people are educated on this process. So because we recognize that wild type studies as opposed to attenuated studies, 
where you only given um, the disease or the pathogen in a controlled environment, we will get the net result from knowing exactly what this is. And mind you, keep in mind that we've been doing this for over, this disease has been in existence for over a hundred, a decade. We've been fighting it for over a decade. I mean, over, excuse me, over a century. And we have yet to come up with a solution. So we believe that this right here is the ethical thing to do to save lives. We believe that this is the right thing to do. And that we believe that it would advance science in every form, shape or fashion. For these reasons, we, Resolved that yes, wild type studies should be do, used to eradicate or come up with a cure for tuberculosis. Thank you. The House thanks the Prime Minister and now calls on the Leader of the Opposition, Camellia, to deliver the first opposition speech of the round, not to exceed four minutes. Um, I would like to thank everybody for this opportunity given to us and unlike um, the Prime Minister of the government, we oppose wild type case studies. And I will give you three points as to why we oppose wild type case studies. Point one, TB has not garnered the type of numbers that would even, that would even cause a desire for a wild type case study. Point two, that we still have an attenuated case study up in the air that researchers can use to develop a vaccine that will be effective in treating tuberculosis. And point three, it will attack minority and underprivileged communities again. And as the government so eloquently spoken on their case about wild type case studies and how this should be used to create a vaccine for tuberculosis, I'm explaining why it shouldn't. Where are the numbers in the research that says that we need to use a wild type case study? Well, tuberculosis has not garnered the reputation of a COVID or smallpox. We are not at the numbers where it is killing small countries, where it is taking out families with a single cough in the air. We have not gotten to those numbers. Even in a hundred years, have we not gotten to those numbers? And so because we've not gotten to those numbers, there's no need to ask someone to sacrifice their life to create a vaccine. And as I said in my second point, we still have the attenuated case study. Scientists can still take that slow route of creating research by using animals and cadavers and other elements to develop the research needed to make an effective vaccine for tuberculosis. And like I said in my last point, it is going to attack minority communities again. Tuberculosis, the numbers show, attacks minority and um, underprivileged communities. And we've already had a dark cloud over this country with these type of case studies in the past, such as the Tuskegee experiment. And so you're asking underprivileged communities to again, to, co to come in again, consent or no consent, and asking them to lay down their lives for the greater good of society, where they have already given up their lives by not having the education that they need, by not having the jobs that they need, by not getting the medical care that they need to begin with, which has caused them to develop back bacteria such as tuberculosis. And so we are asking these communities to come in once again and we're saying for the greater good of man, we have a bacteria that has not quite grasped a hold on this community, but we need you to potentially give up your life in this radical case study to, to create a vaccine. No, unlike the government, we don't believe that anything ethical is going on in asking individuals to consent to something like that. Explain where there is something ethical going on. Explain to society how it makes sense for an individual to go and sign on a dotted line and say, I'm okay with potentially losing my life to create a vaccine, a more effective, so the government says, vaccine for 
tuberculosis. We have a vaccine already out there. Let's get back into the lab rooms and let's work on the vaccine that we already have and let's increase it to make it more powerful than what it already is instead of, instead of sitting here arguing the fact that an individual has to give up their body and give up their life in order to create a vaccine. And so unlike the government, again, as the opposition, we oppose such a radical case study as wild type case studies. And we say that there is no need at all for it. And we, we believe that the government has not proven their point in any way and saying that there is a need for wild type case studies. And with that, I can see the rest of my time. All right, the House thanks the leader of opposition and now calls on the member of government Jerusalem uh, to deliver the second government speech of the round. Hear, hear. All right, um, so I think the first important thing is to note that consent is possible in this type of trial. So not only do we have survey evidence showing that broad majorities do support human challenge trials, a recent survey by David Brookman and Brockman and Josh Kala shows that 75% of people in countries like Australia, the United States, Singapore, and other countries say that they would support a study like a human challenge trial showing that despite the consternation that a lot of elite um, journalists and ethicists have have lodged, the majority of people do not actually see this as a largely important ethical um, problem. So I think that's really important to level set what our intuition should be around whether or not this is actually ethically permissible. And I think beyond that too, we obviously allow people to do a lot of consent to a lot of different things all the time um, for their own well-being and not for altruistic reasons um, in order to get, you know, to make a good living. We allow people to consent to very dangerous um, uh, you know, professions like logging or uh, um, or being a police officer or things like that, which, you know, there also comes with a direct risk to your own life and to the lives of other people. So I think it's clear that we already as a society uh, allow some risk to be garnered by individuals in order for them to go about their lives. You know, just driving a car in general is obviously a massive risk that people take on every single day in the pursuit of much smaller goods, like just being able to Talk, uh, hang out with your friends or go to work. And in this situation, what we're talking about is a much larger benefit, obviously. It's a benefit to saving millions of lives. And I think one big point that Charles brought up in the Prime Minister's Constructive is that, you know, we have, this, is a, a, this is a disease that's been ravaging people for over 100 years. And there's a, a structural reason why um, the traditional vaccine trials have not been able to um, uh, you know, solve for this problem uh, because the majority of people who are actually uh, getting tuberculosis and are at risk of death are in developing nations and, and not in nations where there would be a massive profit incentive to actually pursue a uh, expensive phase three trial. Um, and in addition, because of the way that tuberculosis actually functions in that, you know, it, it, it can take years for the symptoms to actually, or for the infection to actually take hold of the body, it is really expensive and difficult to run these types of trials. And we are left with substandard um, vaccine as a result. Um, the leader of the opposition said that we already have a vaccine and that that is sufficient. Um, I think it's pretty clear that that uh, the vaccine is not actually um, leading to the to the benefits we need. It's not, it only reduces, uh, it reduces death uh, in, in infection in young people by under 15%. Um, that's not something that is um, obviously uh, at the level we want from a vaccine. Um, and I think that there are two other points that we obviously wanna talk about here. Um, you know, the leader of the opposition talked about how minority communities and underprivileged individuals are at risk when it comes to human challenge trials. Um, well, I think that there are two things. One is that the people who are currently at risk um, are also extremely underprivileged. The people who are um, at risk of dying are people who are HIV positive, who are in countries where there is no treatment available to them. These are not people who are in developed nations that have access to the types of tuberculosis treatments that would actually save their lives. Um, and importantly, I think it's uh, we should give people the agency to make decisions. Obviously, no one should be forced into making these um, decisions, but there are ways to design these types of trials to ensure that people have an understanding and able are able to consent into um, making this decision for themselves. And I think on top of that, that you know, no one consents to getting tuberculosis either, but we're not living in a world where no one can get tuberculosis or one where we're inflicting it upon a population. We're living in a world where there are millions of people who are going to die of tuberculosis unless we accelerate these trials. And then additionally, um, I think it's important to note that uh, we're not saying that this wild type, um, you know, um, 
uh, uh, human challenge trials are the end-all be-all of the conversation, these human challenge trials actually allow us to identify these uh, the vaccines that can be moved to phase three um, trials as well, which is important because it will actually increase the number of um, investors that are willing to invest in phase three trials if we have evidence that the vaccine that we are choosing, um, that they're going to pour tons of money into, is actually going to um, uh, uh, work. And so with that, I yield the rest of my time. You're here. The House thanks the member of government and now calls on the member of opposition to deliver the final constructive speech of the round before we do four speeches, uh, not to exceed four minutes. Uh, thanks, Josh. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, I'll get started. So thank you so much to the government uh, for their articulation for the case in support of wild type TB human challenge studies. And thank you to the esteemed panel of judges and the audience for joining this evening to hear about how we can fight tuberculosis. As a member of the opposition, I'll be examining the government's case and making the case for why, despite their arguments, wild type human challenge trials for tuberculosis are not justified. Um, so the first point that the government makes is that uh, wild type human challenge trials can advance vaccine development for tuberculosis and that they're better, uh, notably than alternatives such as attenuated human challenge studies. Now the resolution assumes that wild type hum uh, human challenge studies for tuberculosis are going to be useful, uh, but we contend on the opposition that they're not going to be uniquely or monumentally useful uh, when compared with alternatives like attenuated human challenge studies. Now, the main reason for this is that human challenge studies on their own are usually insufficient for vaccine authorization. Uh, as Jerusalem explained uh, in, in a recent speech, uh, a common use case for human challenge studies is to get some indication of whether or not a vaccine works, um, and then using that as evidence to move forward to a phase three trial, perhaps to secure funding. And that, that is to say that a challenge study doesn't need to be um, in, its, in itself sufficient for, for authorization, just a mere indication that a vaccine is, is better than another vaccine uh, might be sufficient. And that's exactly what an, an attenuated human challenge study can do. Modifying the virus to make sure it's safer and then using it in a human challenge study uh, has worked uh, previously with other diseases such as uh, hookworm to move forward uh, to advanced studies. Um, what is more, attenuated studies on their own sometimes are sufficient uh, to license vaccines. So in 2013, results from a human challenge study using an attenuated version of cholera um, were sufficient uh, in combination with safety data to license a vaccine. So we concede that to some extent, wild type human challenge studies with TB are going to be useful, uh, but they're not so useful, we contend, that they're um, sufficient to justify uh, being perhaps the riskiest human trial of the last decade, exposing people to a disease for which we have no really good cure, uh, and that the, the cure itself, that the best treatments for TB uh, themselves have a toxic effect on the liver. Uh, we think this is unjustified. What is more, we think we should explore other alternatives first, like addressing TB comorbidities, like uh, hunger, HIV, uh, making sure there's clean water. We think these are very reasonable things to do first before deliberately infecting volunteers with a dangerous disease. Um, to the government's second point, arguing that consent is legitimate and ethical, uh, we have a few responses. So first, uh, we'll concede that uh, volunteers can perhaps in some sense, uh, in some sense consent to a big risk. Uh, we first point out that this, again, would be the riskiest trial uh, in the last decade, uh, and perhaps even more than that. And so it should sort of be a last resort in our fight against tuberculosis. We don't think the government has reached that point of argumentation to say that we need to do this now. Uh, but second, notably, even if volunteers can consent, uh, bystanders can't. And one unique aspect of TB human challenge trials is that you get latent infection in the trial that can become activated later, potentially causing community transmission. We think this is a really important sort of philosophical uh, case uh, that, that Camilla pointed out will overwhelmingly fall on minority communities, that if someone becomes latently activated with tuberculosis, it could cause community transmission later. Those people did not consent to being uh, infected with tuberculosis, and we think scientists have a moral obligation to not infect people who do not consent um, to a dangerous disease. Um, what is more, I, we think that's wrong in itself, but additionally, we think it could cause a huge decrease in public trust in science if there is a case of a death or a serious illness in a human challenge trial or a significant community transmission. Uh, there's significant historical precedent for this. So uh, in 1996, there was a meningitis vaccine trial or a drug trial um, in Nigeria that resulted in 11 deaths. And as a result, there is significant uh, lack of trust in, in Nigeria for vaccines compared to peer countries. Um, there is a 30% uh, increase in polio because there was a boycott of the polio vaccine. So potentially, you know, even though a death is unlikely in a TB vaccine study, if a death were to occur, it could potentially just be catastrophic for vaccine uptake in general. So to conclude, um, though we concede wild type studies uh, could be somewhat useful, we think they're not uniquely and monumentally useful, not useful enough to justify the very, very significant risk to volunteers. Um, secondly, we think that the risk to bystanders are uh, the bystanders from the trial 
are just too high um, to be philosophically defensible. And we also think that it could lead to backlash against vaccination that ultimately means the expected value of the trial could be negative um, because a serious illness or death would be so bad. Uh, thank you so much. All right, uh, the House thanks uh, the member of the opposition and um, we'll now start floor speeches, which uh, again are two minute speeches. Um, the first one is gonna be for government, uh, Brian. Uh, it should be Brian in the Bronx, if someone can make, let me see if I can get Brian as a- Yep, yeah, I'm here. Great. Go ahead, um, uh, Hi, I'll, I'll keep it short, but uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you everybody for participating. Okay, I'll make two points very briefly. One, um, we are at war against not, you know, just bacteria and viruses, um, but the leading cause of death for people with HIV is tuberculosis. Going all the way back to um, finding, you know, trace amounts in uh, mummies in Egypt, we know that TB has been around for a while. With 50 million people dead in the last decade and 50, 5 zero in the last 20 years, um, it, it is time. There's already been drug resistant outbreaks. Um, and even the ethics that are sacrosanct, right? They weren't, <clears throat> they weren't uh, carved in stone in, in a contextual vacuum. You, you know, you, if you tell your uh, doctor or lawyer something, um, it's privileged unless, you know, uh, you say you're going to hurt yourself or hurt someone else. And just the way there's an exception to that, um, there is to, to this, this is a, a state of emergency. Most importantly, the chief argument against this, as far as um, the bystander argument, that someone can't give consent because someone else, year, you know, months or years later could be infected. By that argument, you're telling me, as someone who is HIV positive, um, that even if I use protection, um, even if I tell my partner, um, you know, I'm, I'm undetectable, the, the risk is zero, but we'll still use protection and we use a condom, it's still unethical because if there's a small risk that my partner might become infected with HIV and years later, he can go infect someone else. So by me and my partner making informed consent to, to have sex and take a small risk with protections, that's unethical? No, I, I think for that reason, the, the opposition um, argument has to be rejected. This it, it's not an unethical, it's, it's needed and ethical. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Brian, for floor speech for Gov. Um, do we have a, a, we have a cross bench, but do we have a floor speech for Ob? Does anyone want to um, give a speech in support of the opposition? Um, can I do it, Josh, or we need someone else to do it? No, you you you're gonna give another speech in like two in like a minute, right? Like for uh, the, the your leader opposition uh, closing statement. Um, all right, do we have any any floor speech for Ob? All right, um, so I'll call on Tejas to give a floor speech for the crossbench. Okay, I only have two minutes. I'm just going to spend like a minute on each side um, and I might be a little fast. Uh, so I'll start on Gov. I just want to address three claims that the op made. The first is the claim that attenuated studies are enough and we don't need these kinds of studies. So the first observation I want to make is the topic says conditional on live studies being useful. So like, I feel like the topic is an ethical question about whether given that these live studies are to a substantial extent more useful than attenuated studies, whether they'd be ethical to do. So like, this seems to just challenge the assumption behind the topic that live studies are useful in a meaningful way. If they aren't, then this topic is not really relevant. The second observation that I want to make is that this assumes that even if attenuated studies are enough, like maybe you can get approval with an attenuated study. It assumes that the route happens. But what Jerusalem explains basically is that if you feel less confident about running a trial, so even if you think like maybe there's a chance that this trial gets rejected or the vaccine we develop after this gets rejected, 
rejected, that's a huge risk and potentially a huge sunk cost for any pharmaceutical company. So that could actually just be a disincentive to run a trial in the first place. The second is about like the issue of whether people should sacrifice their lives for this, or at least that even if this is consensual, this should be some kind of a last resort. I feel like this falls prey to the act omission distinction because people are dying of tuberculosis. It's just that we don't feel culpable for those deaths because we aren't actively causing those deaths. But there's no actual reason to think negligence in the face of death is meaningfully better than actively killing people. Fine on all three things. Like one, I think there are actually philosophical arguments for the act omission distinction. For instance, a lot of people have the intuition that you shouldn't push a fat man in the trolley problem to save a bunch of people. So maybe there's an argument that you shouldn't be inflicting harm, even if it's for the greater good. The second is maybe the argument is that it increases hesitancy. So once you develop something like a vaccine, maybe the notion that this happened through a challenge study that was potentially unethical, especially among marginalized communities, could disincentivize them from taking up the vaccine once it happens, which is potentially much more important once you have the vaccine developed. The third, and this isn't, hasn't really been talked about since the introduction, is like this could have externalities because like if you are infected with live tuberculosis, you could spread it to other people who aren't consenting. So even if you consented, your consent doesn't affect the consent of other individuals who are like affected by the study in ways that they didn't choose to be. My time is up. All right, uh, thank you for, for the floor speech. Um, one last call if anyone wants to do floor speech for op. All right, um, well, we'll have uh, Camilla, I call on the leader of opposition to uh, recall the leader of opposition to give a closing statement, uh, not to exceed two minutes, reminding her that new examples are welcome, but new arguments are not. Camilla, you might be on mute. Sorry. So I would like to begin by introducing the audience and the judges to a man named John. John is 32 years old and he has four children. John has worked his whole life and he barely makes $30,000 a year. John has contracted tuberculosis. He's being treated with the current vaccine for tuberculosis and the treatments given by his doctor. John is doing everything that John can to assure that the longevity of his life goes into the years where his children are walking down the aisle and having children of their own or marriages and living lives of their own and that he's able to see it happen. And then doctors offer him an opportunity to sign a consent form and potentially get a vaccine that could effectively treat tuberculosis to the point where John doesn't have a cough and he doesn't have the side effects that he currently faces now from tuberculosis. The problem is that if John signs this consent form, he could also be signing away his life. John could walk into that research room and days later could never wake up again because John is poor and lives under the poverty level. John is backed into a corner again. Society has laid out to John again, telling him that his life is not quite as valuable as the man who's in a different tax bracket. Society is saying to John again, that John, because you don't make six figures, it just makes sense for you to be the test dummy for our wild type case studies. And John, don't you wanna get better? And when this is all said and done with, we'll give you a couple of gift cards and hopefully we'll give you a vaccine that'll make you feel better. How is that fair to John? How is that fair to John to ask him because you've dragged your feet for so many years on a vaccine to ask him to now step up to the plate and make a vaccine happen? That's not fair to John. That's not fair to John's children. That's not fair to John's wife. What is fair to John is that researchers put in the time and the effort that researchers tap into 
other forms of research and other forms of case studies to find a vaccine for John that will effectively treat the disease that John is currently facing. That is what's fair to John. John is not trying to become another participant of another Tuskegee experiment. John just wants to survive. And so he is saying a wild type case that he makes no sense right now. What makes sense is to create a vaccine that will save his life. Thank you. It has thanks to the leader of opposition and then calls uh, the prime minister, recalls the prime minister Charles to over the final speech of the round, not to exceed three minutes. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, enlighten y'all on this particular subject matter. I want to introduce y'all to uh, China, the Federation of Russia, Brazil, and South Africa, where this particular pathogen is running, is running rampant. So all the Johns in these countries are dying because there's not a vaccine for them. I want to introduce y'all to what was known as tuberculosis alley right in here in New York. It was right out on the outskirts of the practice where tuberculosis had ran rampant and they had put everybody on this alley. Why? Because they didn't have no particular vaccine for it. The World Health Organization said that they want to eradicate tuberculosis by 2035. Now, why are we saying the World Health Organization and not CDC? The reason why we're saying the World Health Organization is because this is a worldwide pandemic. Remember this here. We heard about Omicron. We say we heard about it in South Africa. The next time I heard it, it was in Southeast Washington. These diseases and this particular pathogen don't have no border. And, and because of these reasons, we offer this, that the impact of not doing anything or not taking, a, at least venturing out to explore the probability of getting a vaccine versus continue the course has already proven to show us that it's not working. This is what the World Health Organization said. They said that we need to come up with a better vaccine, something that will be more aggressive in terms of correcting this problem. What is it? What this is? Is this particular wild type study? This wild type study will produce this result. And as far as people not consenting, people has already we already made the case that people have already consented to this. That this is not something that people are not aware of. Lastly, we want to recognize that we went on this point because we're saving lives. We're not talking about not saving lives. We're not talking about killing people. We're talking about stopping people from dying. And people are dying. We heard that 15 million people died from tuberculosis. We heard that 50 million people have died in the last decade. We heard that 45% of the deaths will result if nothing is done, if no treatment is given. The treatment is current treatment is given. It's not changing these statistics. This current treatment is given is, is adding to these statistics. It's adding to the death toll. It's not resulting in not return, uh, resolving the problem. And we believe that the ethical thing to do is, the ethical thing to do is to save lives. Yeah, we want to save John. We want to save the Johns of the world. We want to save the Johns of the, that's going to be in the Southeast Washington. We want to save the Johns that's going to be in the burials in California where, where these environments are, you being used for the infestation of this particular pathogen. And for these reasons, we believe that not only it was, it's ethical, but it's the right thing to do. And the right thing to do in this case is to save life. And we made the case where we will be saving life. Thank you very much. All right, uh, well, thank you to both teams. And um, we're gonna send the judges out um, to their own Google Hangout. Um, and they can kind of just shut off their, their videos and microphones um, uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes. And while they're out there conferring and, and discussing the case, uh, what we're gonna do is have a panel with um, uh, some people who've been in past COVID challenge studies. And I think we have, um, I think it's four people um, we've got Alistair, Jacob, Paul, and Paresh, I believe, um, unless Jacob couldn't make it. Um, and so um, how about, uh, Danny, could you just spotlight the, um, our, uh, our four COVID challenge panelists? Great. Um, okay. Uh, so first, um, first, I just want to thank our, our panelists, both for participating in a, in a COVID challenge study, but also um, 
they're they're all in England, I believe, right now, and it's quite late there. And uh, so we really appreciate you all making the time uh, and, and all joining us tonight. And um, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's literally mid the clock just struck midnight. Um, so uh, I guess my first question, uh, well, maybe I'll ask about the, you know, what you all thought about, about the debate tonight and, and what your perspective as people who've actually been in a challenge study. Um, and then maybe I'll ask um, stuff about the, the challenge study you were in and, and we can take some questions from the audience. Um, so yeah, so first, maybe I'd just love to get everyone's thoughts uh, about the debate so far and, and kind of how you think about this debate, you know, given your own experiences. I guess I'll start then. Um, so I guess, yeah, in terms of the, the debate, in terms of the arguments for government and opposition, I guess I'm, I guess, in a sense, somewhat biased, given my past and uh, kind of why I'm on this uh, Q&A section of the panel. Um, I can obviously agree with both sides of the arguments, obviously in terms of the government argument for you know, that, that what is currently out there in terms of vaccine isn't really having a significant impact on the number of deaths over the past decade, past 50 years, etc. So it kind of speaks to that argument to um, kind of, if, you know, if every life matters, then it's trying to make a dent somewhere. But I think on the opposition side, I also get the point heavily around um, consenting for those who aren't part of the challenge study, which I guess from my own experience, um, I guess, yeah taking part in the challenge study, obviously I was required to give consent, um, but it didn't affect anybody kind of wider than me in a sense, because I was you know, confined and quarantined and there were certain entry criteria before I was kind of effectively released back into society. So there wasn't any of those ethical arguments around um, those who haven't consented and whether they're then subsequently at risk as a result of the challenge study. What did other people think? Well, um, I thought it was quite interesting, to be honest. It was the first kind of discussion like this that I've witnessed. Um, I thought for both sides, it were quite interesting arguments to see. Uh, however, what I wondered about mostly is that this is quite broad and political and philosophical in terms of the questions that are asked. So I think when we're asking about consent, for example, if a person like this fictional John is forced into a a corner where basically it's not a free decision anymore. This is more a question about implementation and about how you implement a trial like this. What are the incentives that are offered and which options does someone who we are asking consent of actually have? And this is something that is, is more a question of how a policy is implemented and not really a question about um, whether it's right or not, if we can assume full agency and the option of this person to, to say yes and no in its own regard and not being forced into this corner. Um, and I think that these detailed questions, of course, probably can't really have enough space in this kind of discussion, but this was something that I mainly wonder about. So what, what are the details? Um, and I think this is where it will fail or, or win for me. Yeah, I think it's interesting how um, arguments for challenge studies vary between pathogen to pathogen because the, the arguments for a TB challenge study are actually, they're like, I guess on the fundamental level they're the same, but you don't actually need to, take, to abstract it much before it's really quite different. Like the latent period of TB, TB is just not normally something that you get with COVID and it's like, it makes it really much more complicated. Um, so it's like, I guess the, the, the kind of weird thing about TB is you have to, like, you would really have to attenuate the pathogen uh, to ever get a challenge study, a past an ethics committee. So you have this like extra level of, um, like this kind of weird extra level that you just don't get with COVID. Um, cause COVID was just, you could manufacture COVID as it is in the wild, as long as you give it, uh, you know, relatively healthy young people, you get a really low level of risk anyway, but having to create that level of risk artificially. Um, is like is this weird thing you have to do with TV studies um, and like makes the whole argument just a lot more difficult, um, makes the whole thing a lot more difficult to do. So it's interesting how like arguments have to vary between pathogen to pathogen um, is like one, one point I took. Yeah, um, I think I actually agree. Well, I agree with everybody who's spoken previously, but especially Alistair there, it's quite interesting how, um, you know, how, how easy an argument can be made for a control of, of certain 
uh, pathogen disease and how difficult it can be for another. Um, but I think when I see going back to consent, as people have mentioned previously, I am very much having, you know, been through a consent procedure, which itself is almost overly tedious at times, really, to uh, to go through, to get yourself onto it. I think it can, uh, I fully believe people can obviously understand the other parameters as well, but I think generally the camp that, as long as the has been doing right, and it, as Alessia was making a great point of, it's done in a way in which t a TB training trial can be viable. I think there is an area in which um, the consent procedure can be safe and applicable for anybody wanting to go forward, but, and there's no risk in there really in terms of what they're going forward for. But I think it's very interesting so far to listen to everybody's views and opinions. Um, Brian, what was your what was your question? Um, when okay, at the point when you're going to use uh, human challenge, all the all the normal ethical questions have already been answered in like the phase one and phase two part of the clinical trial, right? Like. You know the the, the um, racial and social economic makeup of the you know the participants, the efficacy of the drug, like all those questions um, about ethics are already addressed in stage one and stage two of the trial. So um, I see it like by the time you get to that point to where you're ready to go to human challenge trials. Um, you know, that aspect the, the, of the ethical question of the participants and who's in the study, that's already been addressed. I mean, am, am I right in that? Like, Well, I think, um, uh, sorry to question here, so, but, but yeah, but I, I think um, that to me raises the, the, you know, I think uh, a lot of times it's, it's oh, well, we do a challenge study to test a vaccine, um, but not all challenge studies involve a, a vaccine. And in fact, the challenge studies, uh, you, you, the challenge studies you all were, were in, um, didn't involve a vaccine. And so uh, I'm curious, you know, um, you know the, the way I'll kind of take Brian's question is to um, ask, you know, what was it like to be in a challenge study that didn't have a vaccine? And what were kind of, you know, your goals in being in that study? What were you hoping would, would happen? Um, uh, yeah, so I'm curious what the panelists, you know, want to kind of tell us about, about how that piece of it works. Yeah, so I think I'll kick off again on that. So I think to the kind of two questions there, um, really. So I'd never participated in a challenge study prior to the COVID one. Um, so I guess, like I say, different to other challenge studies where yeah, participants are either given a vaccine or a placebo. This is, you're given yeah, um, a dose of the pathogen um, to test the yeah, immune, immune response. So some one perspective from a participant point of view, it was, it's kind of more, or at least I felt it was more definitive in terms of you knew what you're getting yourself into, even though that sounds a little bit silly, I guess, from a yeah, trial perspective where you've been uh, given a vaccine or a placebo, and I guess placebo in theory, there's no effects. But in this, it just felt more definitive in terms of you knew what you were getting into. And um, to points earlier, there's plenty of paperwork and consenting that goes along with it, really. Um, I think what I kind of got out of the study and what I quite enjoyed about it to an extent was um, kind of how interesting it was on kind of my level. So I, you know, I did science at a you know, reasonably early age and then after that I moved out to more maths heavy stuff, but my, the way my brain tends to think I'm fairly, fairly curious about you know, science and the, the way it, uh, you know, elements work. So, and I think what I found with the study and the doctors and nurses at Oxford were, they were quite engaged and keen to share results and almost you know, try and put it on a level that participants could kind of understand and you could almost see what the tangible results were to an extent. I think as well, going further from that, um, obviously, you know, it's a, it's a lot of different things. Going forward into a trial, um, but I didn't have vaccine into it and like my thought process of my thought process of that. Um I do agree with impression sense like it was more definitive than what you're going in for. Like I was very much instead of a mindset of being like, will it be given placebo? Will I be given this? I was very much a mindset of going in and being like, yeah, I'm gonna get COVID. Uh, which, which in a way made my decision a lot easier and um, being yes. But um in the sense as well, like I think is also the circumstance that really um driven a few of my decisions with this because 
my main motivating factor for going into the trial was to you know make an impact on the pandemic and hopefully help us find out ways to fight this and obviously and find vaccines and obviously as time went on and like you know vaccines were brought up before my actual time in the trial my motivation changed into like you know further push for further trial studies and um you know why the vaccine equity and all, all that sort of stuff so really the actual um concept of a trial of what has been put into me really didn't matter as much anymore it's more the, the challenge trial as a whole as a picture of what it's doing it could affect rather than how it actually impacted me whilst i was in it however i will say in a way um not getting a back i can almost see people getting a vaccine to go into a challenge trial as kind of like a positive thing because they'd be given you know you'd be given a vaccine that you maybe wouldn't have got otherwise outside of it which gives you a sense of um immunity so i can see what people are motivated with that similarly how um when i went into when i went in, into the trans trial in early march um here in the uk um i was far off getting any of my do my first dose of the coronavirus vaccine so i actually saw it as a positive in a sense because i was going to be like this is going to give me a sense of um immunity in the sense of like you know from um, antibodies from actually having an infection that i wouldn't have had otherwise and that's a quote out there and i just saw that as quite positive from leaving about it and i felt more confident going back out into public knowing i had some sort of built immunity potentially from my infection that I had within the trial. So my uh, the next question um, comes from Zachariah Kafuko, um, uh, the head of One Day's uh, Africa chapter, and he asks: um, After listening to this debate, do the panelists feel uh, stronger or less enthusiastic about participating in trials? And after the debate, would the panelists um, actually sign on to a wild type uh, TB challenge trial? Um, I guess I'll go again. <laughs> um, I suppose in the general sense, like after this debate, my opinion has said it always has been, I believe extremely strongly in challenge trials and the, the the wide news they can have in basically in fact us fight so many different passions and diseases and um i think they are such an effective tool we have to use at our disposal and i think they can be done safely they can be done with full consent from volunteers and where they can be used safely they should be used as they can you know they can be such a vital tool we have in fighting this and um and again i think obviously you know when, when it comes to it, i'll obviously you know reassess all the the, the trial itself as I did when I went to COVID-1 but at this point in time I could see myself yes very much signing up to a um, or type TB challenge trial if it meant it could have the effect that we hope it would have um, and was fighting and building better vaccines against tuberculosis. Yeah um, I'd agree with that on a, on a moral level I wouldn't change my mind and I'd say um, that the wild type study should probably go forwards and should be allowed. That's my personal view. Um, I've been not only exposed to COVID, but also to malaria. And both of these studies um, had in common that they were not testing a vaccine on me, but there happened to be a control group for just seeing how effective their method of infecting people with malaria was in that other trial I did. So I knew that I would just get malaria and not um, COVID. Uh, not a vaccine at all. Um, so um, I think, however, when I would have to make the decision for myself, I would go into a wild type TB um, study is um, that I think it's really important to, to run the numbers uh, for myself. And here I think, um, I mean, the outcome of this is potentially huge. If, if there would be an effective vaccine that could save potentially millions of lives, that is from a organizational point of view, very, very important. So the numbers there are very clear for me personally, of course, knowing that we're in, in the four figures kind of lethal risk um, to 1,000 to 3,500, whatever it will be, um, is very, very different from what I've been running through when we were exposed to COVID, for example, where I think my personal risk was calculated one, around one to 300,000. Um, which is a very, very different ballpark. So I, I would have to think very carefully um, if I would participate in something like this myself, but I think the option should, should be there. 
Um, so we're about to call our, our judges in. So we're going to have uh, one last question. And um, uh, then, um, and so I'm just going to put in the, the chat if people um, haven't voted yet, um, just to, to make sure to do that before the judges come in. Uh, the last question I'll ask, um, and I apologize if I get your, if I mispronounce your name, um, but is from uh, Ope Osunkoya, um, who asks, were there any financial considerations and how did they consider the second order consequences um, of your of your choices, long-term uh, consequences, infections to neighbors or uncertainty of, of full consequences of the uh, decisions? Anyone wants to go? Otherwise, I'm happy to. Okay. Oh, yeah, you go. Um, so the compensation was was actually quite good, and it was definitely definitely a factor. So um, as much as I think this is very interesting, and as much as I uh, actually almost as weird as it might sound, enjoyed the experience um, to be part of this challenge of these challenge trials. Um, I'm not sure it would have caught my attention just as much if, if I didn't know that. Um, that I could make money with this. So yeah, this is something that I think needs to be considered also for in, in which situations you put people into and in which pressure you can put someone into when they really need money. So I think this is what I meant earlier when I think about the corner that someone can get back into so that it's not really a free decision anymore. Um, but yeah, so the monetary incentive definitely played a role for me. Yeah, I mean, I'd say I'd agree. I mean, truly, I'm not even just saying this to seem moral. Um, when I first signed up for trial, I didn't have, um, I didn't realise there's payment until I asked Alistair, who was talking about it, and he mentioned conversation. I was like, we're getting paid for this. And I was like, quite surprised by the whole thing. So, but when I did find out, it was then, yes, a very much a motivating factor. I won't lie about that. Like, it wasn't the only reason I did it, but it was still a motivating factor for it. Um, and I think that as... Um, as was just put, I think that is a thing that should be considered for it as well, and is a decision making factor. Um, as the second question, when you said like concern about infecting family or neighbours and stuff like that, um, this is when, um, as Paul mentioned, when you answered the previous question, is in terms of like part of the decision making is weighing up the risk of like benefit version potentially infected people, which would be a problem with wild type thing. However, with our coronavirus trial, I was part of, we weren't allowed to leave until we were one hundred percent. But not infectious and not able to infect anybody else outside of the trial so really that's never a concern for me because we would never be out we would never been put in that position to uh, potentially infect others yeah i was i i was slightly different i was like not really motivated by the conversation at all um i actually like i'm uh, currently in the process of just giving the whole amount away um i'm current i'm going to give it to you Part of it went to Gabby, part of it went to the Against Malaria Foundation, um, and the rest of it is going to go to um, the Liverpool Pandemic Institute, um, specifically for their preparations to create facilities to do human challenge studies in pandemic situations. Um, so um, that like, kind of sets out where my opinions are post the trial. Um, and also, like the conversation, it didn't, it didn't really, like, it wasn't really something I was, I was particularly interested in. I should probably point out as well, talking about conversation, I'm actually, um, I work for kind of one you know, so I kind of like am paid by one you know, as well. Um, but yeah, the compensation for the study itself um, really didn't enter my decision making process at all because I decided well before I signed the consent forms that I just wasn't going to take it um, and had been reasonably public about that before that point. So yeah, it just wasn't really a concern for me. Yeah, and I think my opinion on the kind of financial side of it is similar to yours after really it didn't really um, come into my thoughts to be to begin with really or any point. So to date, I'll give a small chunk away to yeah, kind of few charities close to friends and family's hearts um, and yeah, put a portion of it towards you know, yeah, almost treating other friends and family as various bits and don't get me wrong I obviously kept a portion for myself but um, I remember most of the way through my trial I was talking to one of my study doctors um, because it didn't really give a massive incentive to me I, I said as a personal level it wouldn't be for everybody I would have done it for probably a, a quarter of the amount I, it kind of wasn't really much of a factor in mind. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, well, any last thoughts um, before our judges are kind of filtering back in now? Um, so any any last things to to add um, before we um, switch over to to them?
Well, we really appreciate, um, yeah, thank, thank you all um, for, for calling in from England. Um, most of our, when we'll, we'll um, uh, hopefully you'll all be able to stick around and uh, chat to people in the, the Zoom rooms, but we uh, completely understand if, if not. And um, yeah, you know, this event was supposed to take place in, in person in DC. And, and so most of the people who are judges and attendees are, are DC based. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you all are probably close to the fur furthest away. And so we really appreciate it too. Uh, appreciate it and appreciate um, your volunteering. All right, so hopefully we've got most of our, our judges back. Um, and uh, uh, there's Anne. Um, and so basically um, what we're gonna do, uh, there's Camilla, um, is I think we will try to mostly do, um, people introduce themselves by alphabetical order. So we'll try to do reverse alphabetical order um, for people to give their uh, reasons for decision. Um, and then uh, we'll uh, announce, um, uh, th then we'll announce um, the uh, results of the floor vote um, of the vote for that poll, uh, which we're going to close in just a moment. Um, and uh, then we'll we'll have a, a kind of brief discussion um, in uh, in the Zoom breakout rooms. All right. Um, so let's see who we have for if we um, are going to call on our judges. Um, do we have? I know Matt. Um, wasn't, you know, uh, wasn't able to introduce himself. Uh, do we have Matt Iglesias there? I, I hope you do. Can you hear me? Uh, we do, we do. Uh, Matt, can you just briefly introduce yourself and then say how you voted and why you voted the way you did? Sure. Um, I'm Matthew Iglesias. I'm the author of a newsletter, Slow Boring, and a few other uh, media things um, here and there. Um, I have no relevant technical background or qualifications. Uh, but I thought that the opposition had the stronger argument overall. I felt that um, the, the risks of um, spillovers from the use of the live vaccine gave me concern and that the government it made a, a, a strong abstract argument for the legitimacy of challenge trials in general, but didn't really have a compelling argument that in this specific case, the live uh, pathogen was truly necessary to achieve uh, benefits that were commensurate to the risks and potential problems. Uh, thanks. Uh, Nikki? Yeah. Um, Charles's closing arguments, I think, really compelled me that the benefits of the trial are worth the risks. Um, however, AB's argument, again, that the wild type might not actually be better than an attenuated um, pathogen, I think, made it, like, really challenging for me. And I actually really wish I could split my vote. Um, but given that I was recently told that it's not permitted, I'm going to go with the government. Okay. Uh, thanks, Nikki. And then uh, Alex. I think we have to let we have to let him unmute himself. Let's see if I can find. He should be able to unmute. Let me see that. Okay, great. I'm unmuted. I came back in as a participant. So uh, I'm in favor of human challenge trials. I've argued in favor of them for uh, COVID and for other diseases as well. Um, so it, it, it hurt me to say that I thought the opposition uh, won. Um, but uh, ironically, I suppose, um, I thought Abby's uh, arguments, uh, two arguments, really were not very well uh, answered, uh, namely the bystander uh, argument and the, um, the fact that the attenuated might be as good or nearly as good as the wild type. I do think both of those arguments can be uh, answered, but I don't think they were. So my vote went to the opposition. Okay, um, Jerry? Yeah, I found it extremely difficult to make this decision. I thought the two strong arguments, like was just said, the bystander argument and the, the other argument that we have an attenu attenuated were a bit confused because, but the opposition didn't answer the bystander argument and the answer is that those people could be closely monitored so they wouldn't if they broke down to become infectious ever uh, 
infect anybody else. That argument was not made, so you can't give the uh, you can't give the government uh, credit for something it didn't say. But I just felt I'd like to get that in, and I don't think we were we were a little bit confused about whether we were judging whether or not the alternative was equivalent or as good as what was proposed a wild type. And so it was confusing because the wording was, if a wild type was useful, would it be ethical? So there was some confusion on our part about that. But aside from those two issues and the issue that there was some confusion on the part of the opposition on therapeutic versus prophylactic, where a therapeutic vaccine is a completely different ethical situation since the person already has TB, and that was in their summary, and that was quite confusing to me. I still would have to go with the opposition as a pure debate. They made the stronger case, and the and the, the pro group, although making good general arguments, I don't think answered the opposition's uh, points, which could have been answered but weren't. And so, from a debate point of view, I would have to give it to the opposition. Thank you, uh, Matt. Yeah, I, I found this to be a difficult decision as well. I thought that the debate was very, very close. Um, I, you know, I, I thought that the opposition drifted into a few arguments that I felt were a little bit maybe off the given topic or, or drifted into areas that I, I didn't think that <clears throat> either the government had made a point of or that that kind of fit so I uh, but but as Jerry had stated there was a little bit of confusion about a certain topics um, ultimately you know I it, very close I had a very hard time making a decision I would just give the slight edge to the government here okay uh, Larissa can you hear me yep um yeah, I also felt that it was extremely close. Um, I, um, alluding to the the confusion um, that we was mentioned just just now, I had been listening to the arguments um, on the understanding that the premise of the debate was that the wild type challenge trials would be useful, meaning would contribute substantially uh, over and above whatever was contributed by um, by the the uh, the attenuated. Um, uh, ch challenge trials. So with that assumption, um, which I think is fair considering the, the way the thing was, I felt that the government made a stronger case. I felt that the government made a strong case that um, though the bystander risk is a problem, it is um, overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of um, people dying from uh, TB currently, and that the um, ethical balancing act that you have to make come, can acceptably come out in favor of the bystander risk versus the risk of not doing everything you can to find a, a vaccine. Thanks. Uh, Jake? I mean, I'm in general in support of human challenge trial. And uh, for this debate really comes down to uh, the wild type versus alternative, which we know, know exists, right? It's been used. And uh, for many of us who are physicians, obviously we all know that the motto is first do no harm. And I do think that if you use wild type, it's gonna cause you more harm than use attenuated challenge, all right? On the other hand, there's no really proven benefit of using wild type over the tenure of this uh, strain to challenge. So there, with there, with that formula, I would say that uh, it, it's you know the team opposition make the point that is that that the alternative is equally as good. Therefore, I would support the, the opposition's uh, argument. Great, um, uh, Phil. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, uh people have sort of raised what the major issues were. I have to admit that, that I did find uh, Charles's argument that uh, tuberculosis is a very serious problem to be quite compelling. And uh, um, I'll point out that Charles did make the claim, which I think was reasonably well justified, that uh, um, 
that using wild type will advance the science in a unique way because we'll learn something about uh, how vaccines work against the wild type virus. And then Jerusalem followed that up by saying that uh, uh, having wild type studies would perhaps uh, uh, be better for inducing investors to invest in subsequent studies of a vaccine that succeeded in a, uh, a wild type challenge study. So, so I didn't feel as though that argument by the opposition was unanswered by the government. I thought there was a, a, perhaps a balance there where I might give a slight edge to the, the government on that argument. I do think that the opposition had the stronger argument on the bystander side of this. Uh, uh, um, uh, and, and of course, as Jerry points out, uh, there are um, reasons why the bystander concerns aren't as great. And, and in fact, uh, uh, Brian in the Bronx uh, had some arguments against the bystander argument also, but I was told that Brian's arguments don't count uh, when we're judging who won the debate uh, between the uh, uh, government and the opposition here. Um, and so I would say that the opposition uh, did make this, this ethical question, which is a very important one uh, in judging human challenge studies, uh, 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 sort of a centerpiece of, of this uh, and, and, and making sure that uh, the bystanders are adequately protected is of course one of the things that people who design and conduct uh, human challenge studies really pay a huge amount of attention to. Uh, I, I think on balance, I will, would, would uh, give a slight edge to the, uh, to the government on this, but uh, if I were not forced to choose, I would call this a draw. All right, thank you. Um, Anne? Hi. Yeah, well, you know, I think all the salient points have been made. I think it was very close. I think there were some good points made by both sides. There were some just misconceptions and false statements made by both sides. On balance, to me, though, I also am a um, supporter of challenge studies in many situations. I felt like the opposition did the better job in the debate primarily because the government, to me, was not convincing that the wild type was enough better than using an attenuated strain that it balanced the risk, and in particular, the risk to bystanders, which they didn't really respond to at all. So I give the slight edge to the opposition. Uh, Ashley? Yeah, I just wanted to thank the um, the debaters for for preparing for this. I know that it's it's always a little bit challenging and and it's also exciting um, when you're giving a new topic and especially something with as many nuances as this. I also want to thank the judges uh, for for participating and, and listening to all of their um, their points. Um, so from my perspective, you know when I when I look at a, a debate, I really focus on, how well each team is able to articulate both sides. Um, you know, from the government side, uh, Charles had kind of started off with talking about like the history main points that it prevents future disease. It's ethical because it prevents future diseases. Um, it's ethical because it'll help eradicate the pathogen. And then it's how ethical that because it'll help advance science. On the opposition side, um, Camilla's three points were that it's not ethical because we haven't garnered enough numbers in order to warrant doing this wild type disease. She kind of followed up with that with her second point that there's already something here that attenuated, we should continue down that path. And then her third point, which was negatively impacting people of color. And then as we kind of shifted into the members of both sides, you're really able to see um, a high level of focus on the third point from Camilla's side, which is negatively impacting the people of color. And I thought that the government did a great job at um, kind of proposing an alternative and an understanding of like consent, um, especially when talking about, you know, other risks to professions and people being able to consent to that and they should be able to consent to this as well. Um, and then on, on the opposition side, I think that they did a good job at, at being able to show um, how it could, how consent isn't really possible when you start to think about the impact to bystanders. So one thing that I was kind of missing 
um, from, from both sides of this was that I felt like from the government side, there wasn't as much of a focus on, on, um, the prevention of future disease. And I, and I kind of wish that you guys went a little bit deeper into that. And then I also wish that there was a little bit more about the discussion of, of the advancement of science and the eradication of the pathogen. Um, on, on the opposition side, um, I, it was a little bit unclear to me when we started to go through the balance of the attenuated disease versus wild type um, versus focusing on the ethics. And, and, and I think that that's really where, where I strayed a lot. Um, I think that the argument became less about ethics um, on the government side than it did on the opposition side. And so with all that being said, um, I do think that who, that the opposition side stuck to the topic more so um, than the government side. Um, and so, and they were able to provide more evidence throughout the debate associated with the in initial reasoning that they provided for why it's not ethical to have wild type. And so with that, I will have to give my vote to the opposition. Okay, thanks. Uh, Camilla? Hi. Um, so first, I just want to say, you know, how hard a debate like this is when we have a bunch of lifelong medical professionals judging people who probably read about this topic like maybe two weeks ago, Ex except for me. I, I also read about this topic like two hours ago. Anyway, um, first, I want to say that, you know, for Gov, um, I really think that they won the point on the ethics of informed consent. And I think that that was a big thing about what this debate essentially was about. Um, their point about, you know, how we consent to taking risks, you know, with dangerous jobs, and especially that we aren't consenting to getting tuberculosis or to passing tuberculosis on people. Um, and then I also really like their point that you know, developing the vaccine would help developing nations as an answer to the ops point about this affecting uh, people who are underprivileged, because I think that that was a direct uh, call to that point, while also sticking to the topic, improving the impact of their point. And for op, I mean, obviously, everyone's already said that the bystanders can't consent, that that's a huge point for op. And also, I don't know if anyone's mentioned it all as well, but the uh, loss of trust in science was also a really great point on op. Um, but I think that I'm going to have to go with Gov just because I think that they really pin the uh, informed consent point. And I think that that's such an important point for this debate. But overall, I think that both sides could have honed you know, the impact more on each of their points and really driven that home. So uh, I'm going for Gov. All right, uh, and Gabe, uh, the last of our judges to give your uh, reason for decision. Great, yeah, uh, thanks everyone for putting this on and you all did a fantastic job, uh, uh, especially as non-subject matter experts really delving into a really complicated topic. Um, yeah, I, uh, I agree uh, substantively with basically everything Camilla said. I think that um, the opposition uh, made a few uh, very solid points that weren't uh, completely refuted by the government, including by standard risk, uh, the attenuated uh, version potentially being sufficient for research and the erosion of trust in this research, potential vaccines uh, and science in general. Um, I do think that the informed consent point, the government, government made a very strong argument. Um, and I do think that that point is uh, one of the most critical ones for the ethical question that was key to the debate. However, I think that the three uh, smaller points that the opposition made incredibly strongly uh, outweigh it for me. So I'd, I'd go with opposition. Okay, so for by my 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 account, uh, I think that's six six um, from our uh, from our judges. Um, and, you know, funnily enough, the audience um, had a different view. Uh, the audience was 75% for Gov, um, which for five votes counts as a 4-1 vote. Um, and so uh, government wins on a vote of 10 to 7. Um, so congratulations to, to both sides and, and thank you so much for the judges. 
Um, we went a bit over, so I think instead of 7.45, we're gonna try to end the, we're gonna go to these Zoom rooms. Um, if you have time, we, we'd love for you to join them and we're gonna um, wrap those up in se at 7.50. Uh, so we'll have 10 minutes to kind of discuss in uh, in smaller groups. And I think Danny will now send us uh, over to there if, if there are no more uh, technical difficulties.